Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Themes from the Gospel of John. So we're going to take a sort of an overall view and we're going to pick out things here and there through the Gospel that are themes we, that the authors picked out. And this particular one, Lesson 8 for November 23 of 2024, is entitled Fulfilling Old Testament Prophecy. So he's saying that one of the themes that we notice here in John, John is trying to prove what we learned from last week. He's trying to prove that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the Son of God. So now one of the ways he's going to prove that is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again to look at your word, to, to see what evidence we can see in these prophecies, how they fit from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and how they point us specifically to the example of Jesus is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. How difficult would it be for you to believe that a person might actually be a God if he looks like you, he dresses like you, he rocks around like a human being. <laughs> Everybody's... That, that wouldn't, wouldn't fit my, my imagination. We, we would have a hard time with it, yeah. wouldn't we? Yeah. In this lesson, we will see an additional collection of reasons why we should believe the truth about Jesus and his divinity, However, we will also see why many people did not believe. He didn't really come necessarily come here to show, act like a god. He was he came with a message and wanted the people to learn learn what he was what he was to do. He, he came to show us the truth about God. Right. Yeah. 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 That was his message. Yeah. It was he was attempting to persuade them. Yeah. With that evidence, as many of the Jews expected, the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 told him that, and was a descendant of David. However, because of the persecution by Herod the Great, remember what he did? Killed the first he one. Tried to wipe out, he tried to wipe out all those babies who are under two years of age. Many people were not aware of those details. Most knew Jesus only as Jesus of Nazareth. That's unfortunate. You, you know, he had... It seems to me that he had to come the way he did because if he came any other way, I mean, other than, other than the way he did, if he came as someone with authority, mm -hmm. they would have... They just swooned they would have, all over him. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. They, they would have just made an idol out of him. Yeah. Yeah. And it apparently was not like the paintings have, have made him about him. He was not a, 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 a charismatic ap appearance and because he was despised and rejected of men. That's what Isaiah 53 says, 52. Yeah. Yeah. But he, it was, remember uh, the story of Ellen White. Nobody, he couldn't get somebody to, to take the message, so he cho uh, chose yeah. a woman who all, all she had going for her was the truth. Yeah. She didn't have a years of education or, right. or degrees and all that sort of stuff. And Jesus, he had a message. And uh, okay. they, he, what did he do with the road to Emmaus? Yeah. He said, uh, he didn't just show, tell who he was. He yeah. took him through the scriptures and let, let him on. With okay, the, he, Jim, tell us how the Bible study guide starts this off. We shall study some pertinent prophecies in the scriptures that clearly reveal Jesus as the promised Messiah. Moreover, we will examine the specific details of how these prophecies were precisely fulfilled. For example, we will look at the fulfillment of the prophecy about how Jesus would enter Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, Psalms 8, 118, 26, and Zechariah 9, 9. We will Excuse me. We also will look at the prophecy of the disciple who try, would betray him, Psalms 41, 9. Moreover, we will study the dynamic of, the, of why some leaders decided to reject him, while prof, surprisingly, others chose to believe in him. Ultimately, in this process, we will consider the question, 
What does it mean to have the mindset of the reasoning from beneath according to John 8, 23 versus a mindset of reasoning from above? From the Bible okay, says. Uh, are you motivated by heaven? Or are you motivated by the devil? From above or below? And I'm, I've often wondered, and I still wonder, I mean, why didn't Jesus flat out <clears throat> tell him that he was born in Bethlehem, that he was the son of David? Did they know that? Well, at the triumphal entry, clear almost at the very end, they, they called him the son of David, so apparently that information finally got around. Um, I would have thought that saying, look, I was born in Bethlehem, I'm a descendant of David, that would have been the right place to start with your evidence. I didn't remember what the fellow he says, you've been with me a long time and you still ask me, who, who, show us the potter. Yeah. He's, he's, uh... Predictions about the ministry of John the Baptist are found in the Old Testament. You can bring us a couple examples of that, Duane. In John 1, 23, John answered by quoting the prophet Isaiah, I am the voice of someone shouting in the desert, make a straight path for the Lord to travel. And? and Isaiah 43, verse 3, 40 verse 3, sorry, a voice cries out, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord, clear the way in the desert for our God. Okay, so there's the fulfillment. It may be difficult for us to understand why some people had trouble believing in Jesus, but look at this, John 14. We talked a little bit about this last week. Do you not believe, Philip, that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, do not come from me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the things I do. Wow. Even some of his disciples had trouble believing Jesus was the Messiah of the Bible. We are not accustomed to having people walking around performing miracles and even raising people from the dead. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we have to give them a little bit of slack, you know. <laughs> okay, there are four known periods in the biblical history when miracles were fairly common. One, obviously at creation. Two, at the time of the exodus from Egypt. Three, during the days of Elijah and Elisha as they worked to stop the advance of Baal worship. And four, during the days of Jesus and his apostles. Now, what is unique? Leave the creation story out because obviously that's a completely and it's a whole different department. But think about the Exodus, Elijah and Elisha, and the times of Jesus and his disciples. What was unique about those times that God felt it was necessary to perform a lot of miracles. It's society, but something pretty far. But was it? it was, these were times of the worst possible conditions. People were worshiping idols. They were, they were turning away from God. They, you know, nobody was, virtu virtually nobody was going in the right direction. So it was, a, it was a, it, these were crises times. What do these periods of divine activity tell us about the relationship between God and us, the state of spiritual enlightenment that typified the people of that time? Many miracles were done by prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha particularly. John chose miracles which he believed, and, and let me not say that, that they were the only ones who did miracles in the Old Testament, but they did quite a number of miracles. And you know, other times there may be one miracle here, maybe one miracle there. So, uh, John chose miracles which he believed pointed specifically to the Messiahship of Jesus and his connection to the Father himself. What was it about those miracles? Duane, I think that's yours. Okay. If Jesus had come right out and said he was the Messiah, the religious leaders looking for anything they could find against him would have pounced on him. Knowing this, Jesus instead pointed to the works he had done. If Jesus had said he was the Christ, they could easily seek to deny that. But how could they deny the signs, the works, and the wonders? I thought they were asking for signs. Yeah, 
<laughs> exactly. These were powerful testimonies to who he was and where he had come from. Yeah. I mean, think of the, the time he, 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 he healed um, the blind man. And they said, well, I don't know who is, what I do know is I couldn't see and now I can. <laughs> okay, how do you deny, how do you see, how do you, how do you deny that? No big long dissertation for that, was it? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> there, and, and, the, and the guy that was dropped through the roof, the paralytic. paralytic. See, okay, they believe that, you know, sin is the cause for disease. So in order to be healed of a major disease, you have to get rid of the sin. So Jesus knew what they were thinking. He says, okay, I'm going to forgive the man's sins. Oh, well, that's terrible. You can't do that. No human being can do that. Okay, watch me. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk out. They don't realize, uh -oh. <laughs> they don't realize that sin has collateral, causes collateral damage. Yeah. And the ultimate demonstration was with Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know? He, he wasn't a sinner, but he, and he didn't fight back. No. He'd already told what you do. If somebody slaps you on, run, skip, cheek, and let him have, to have the other one. When the Sadducees and the Pharisees came together to demand that Jesus give them a sign that he was the Messiah coming from, come from God, he, he responded with a very interesting comment. We talked about this last week, but this is, a, this is the, the final ultimate reason so let's let's look at it again matthew 12 th we're going to look at matthew 12 and luke 16 and luke uh, i mean matthew 12 matthew 16 and luke 11. matthew 12 38 to 40 then some teachers of the law and some pharisees spoke up teacher they said we want to see you perform a miracle how evil and godless are the people on this day jesus exclaimed you ask me for a miracle no the only miracle you will be given is the miracle of the prophet Jonah. In the same way that Jonah spent three days and nights in the big fish, so will the Son of Man spend three days and nights in the depths of the earth. And I'm going to just turn to Matthew 16 here real quickly. Some Pharisees and Sadducees who came to Jesus wanted to trap him, so they asked him to perform a miracle for them to show that God approved of him. But Jesus answered, when the sun is setting, and you say we're going to have a fine weather because the sky is red, and early in the morning you say it is going to rain because the sky is red and dark. You can predict the weather by looking at the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs concerning these times. How evil and godless are the people of this day? You ask me for a miracle? No, the only miracle you'll be given is the miracle of Jonah. So he left them and went away. And then coming back now to Luke, I can get my computer to behave here. Luke 11, 29 and 30. As the people crowded around Jesus, he went on to say, how evil are the people of this day. They ask for a miracle, but none will be given them except the miracle of Jonah. In the same way that the prophet Jonah was, in a, was a sign for the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be a sign for the people of this day. So what was the sign of Jonah? Well, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, which Jonah himself called Sheol or the grave, Jesus would spend three days in the tomb of, of Joseph. Jonah was vomited up on the shore, which was a miracle in itself, but it had nothing to do with Jonah's personal abilities. On the other hand, Jesus told the Jewish authorities, destroy this temple. In other words, what, what is he saying? You're going to kill me, right? destroy this this temple he's pointing to himself um you, he, that was saying effectively you will kill me but three days later i will give you a sign that no human being could ever give a proof of my divinity jesus is rising from the dead in his own power proved his divinity and we'll get to that passage a little bit later jesus assumed that those who were listening to him believed in the old testament to his critics he said Tim, I think that's your turn. John 5, 39 to 40, and verses 46 and 47. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me, yet you are not willing to come to me in order to have life. If you had really believed Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how can you believe what I say? 
from the good news. Now remember that both Pharisees and Sadducees considered the writings of Moses as actually, that's as high as you can get. And Jesus says, you don't even believe the words of Moses. I mean, you know, I, I made reference to Psalm, uh, Matthew 23, and 13 and following regarding the, the scribes, excuse me, the Pharisees and the, or hypocrites and the scribes. But I was reading another book anyway. You get to uh, chapter 23 at verses two and three. They sit in the seat of Moses mm -hmm. and tell the people what to do and you should be doing it, Jesus says, but they themselves don't. Mm -hmm. You're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things that Jesus pointed to that provided convincing evidence was the story of being lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. He spoke to Nicodemus about that. Dwayne? As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's of just a couple of verses before the all-time favorite verse, John 3.16. You know about the Old Testament story. Um, maybe we could just pop over there and look at that real quick. Numbers 23. And spoke against God and Moses. They complained, why did you bring us out in Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food or water? We can't stand anymore with this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and many Israelites were bitten and died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Now pray to the Lord to take these snakes away. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord took, told Moses to make a metal snake and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. Now, can the metal snake heal you? No way. No. So Jesus, Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. Okay, well, but what was the truth about that story? Many people do not believe that God would have sent snakes to bite the Israelites. life. It's important to notice what Deuteronomy 8 verse 15 says. He led them through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. And that dry and waterless land, he made water flow out of the solid rock for them, for you, speaking to the children of Israel. So, those snakes and scorpions were residents of that desert, but God had been protected them from harm until they re rebelled against him and rejected his protection. So what are the forces today that either subtly or openly work to undermine our faith and the authority of the Bible? Our Bible study guide says, in a discussion with the religious leaders about his identity, Jesus affirmed the authority of Scripture. At first glance, it would seem unnecessary for him to do that because the religious leaders believed in Scripture, at least they claimed to. Nevertheless, even with them, Jesus would emphasize the authority of the Scriptures, and he did so in order to show them who he was. No matter how hard their hearts were, and no matter how much they tried to fight conviction. Remember that many of the Jewish leaders had memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew. Did they miss these references that could have applied to Jesus? Jim? Well, the Bible study guide, the problem with the religious leaders is that they knew the letter of the law, but not its spirit. Indeed, they knew the written word, but alas, not the living word. Jesus testified to this failing when he said to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 39 and verse 40 verses, excuse me, in the King James Version. Ancient Jewish traditions taught that merely knowing the scriptures guaranteed eternal life. This notion is evident in what Hillel, a renowned rabbi from the first century BC, reportedly taught about the subject. Hillel is quoted as saying, one who has acquired unto himself words of Torah has acquired for himself the life of the world to come. Mish Mishnah Aboth 2.7. So he, they believed that if you memorized the Torah, you had a guaranteed ticket. Well, what was it? Uh, they, a guy came from some distance. He says, uh, I went to Shimei, who is also one of the leaders, and he says, mm -hmm. what must I do to... Kimmy, uh, tell me the whole law while standing on one foot. Remember that story? 
and uh, anyway, didn't satisfy the guy. He goes over to Hillel. He says, the whole law is don't do to somebody what you wouldn't have done to yourself, and all the rest is commentary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's not as good as do unto others. Yeah. That's the more proactive than, than, than the uh, just. But anyway, at least it's, it's a start. Yeah. Clearly, the Jewish leaders had become so obsessed with their detailed interpretations of the Old Testament scriptures and their hopes of a Messiah that would conquer the Romans that it prevented them from seeing deeper into the actual mission of Christ. Dwayne? The Jewish leaders claimed to believe in Moses, their most revered prophet, but they did not believe in the divine prophet whom Moses prophesied was to come. Upon his departure, Moses promised the people, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Deuteronomy 18.15 Jesus reminded the Jewish leaders that Moses, whom they greatly admired, believed in him and his future mission. Yet, now that his promise was being fulfilled before their eyes, they refused to believe. Jesus remonstrated with them, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And let's just review that. That's an important part of the evidence from the Old Testament. So Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses writes, Instead, he will send you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you are to obey him. And what do you suppose the Pharisees and the Sadducees said when they thought about that verse? How much about Jesus is found in the Old Testament? Estimates vary, but some scholars argue that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament prophecies. Whatever the amount, the odds against one's man's fulfilling even a few of them, much less them all, are staggering. Every now and then someone will use an image like this. Imagine fulfilling, uh, I'm sorry, imagine filling an area the size of Texas with coins two feet high and painting one coin pink and then mixing them all up, then give a blindfolded person one chance to pick the pink one coin. What are the odds that with one pick he or she would get the pink one? No question, Christ's birth, life, and death were predicted by the Old Testament, stunning evidence of his identity as the expected Messiah. John points to these Old Testament texts again and again, make that very point about who Jesus was and also why we should believe in him and accept the salvation he offers. So let's go back to that one of those really face-to-face, -face, great controversy situations in John chapter 8. Try to imagine yourself at this meeting between Jesus and the Sanhedrin. Now, do you remember what was the first 11 verses of John, John 8, just before this occasion? No. That's the story of the woman taken in adultery? Ah, uh, yes, okay. And Jesus said, okay, let me, let me tell you about this, you know, that whoever, whoever is, is not guilty, let him throw the first stone. And he starts writing there, and he starts with the eldest. And he's writing their, their sins in, in the dust and they're in the temple and they're gone. And I don't know, but apparently this occasion happened right after that because it's the next verse. And... So let's start working our way through this. Duane? John 8, 12 to 59. Wow. Yeah, it's so a long a section. Long we're going we're gonna to work on it. Take a couple paragraphs, and then I'll do some, and we'll... Jesus spoke to the Pharisees again. I am the light of the world, he said. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. The Pharisees said to him, Now you are testifying on your own behalf. What you say proves nothing. Okay, I'll take a couple long, next long paragraph there. No, Jesus answered, even though I do testify on my own behalf, what I say is true, because I know where I came from and where I'm going. 
You do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You make judgments in a purely human way. I, press, I pass judgment on no one. But if I were to do so, my judgment would be true because I am the, not alone in this. The Father who sent me is with me. It is written in your law that when two witnesses agree, what they say is true. I testify on my own behalf and the Father who sent me also testifies on my behalf. And I'm, you know, we know who Jesus is talking about. What did they think he was talking about when he talked about his father? Joseph. Joseph is already dead. Did they, did they really think it was Joseph? I don't know. <laughs> we know they're wrong. <laughs> well, where is your father? They asked him. So, yeah, they're, you know, obviously they don't know what he's talking about. You know neither me nor my father. Jesus answered, if you knew me, you would know my father also. And that story is repeated to Philip, isn't it? Clear at the end. Jesus said all this as he taught in the temple in the room where the offering boxes were placed. And no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Okay, Jim, you want to take up the next couple of verses there? So the Jewish authorities said he... Oh, again, again, see, Jesus said to them. He says that we cannot go where he is going. Does this mean that he will kill himself? Jesus answered, you belong to this world here below, but I came, come from above. You are from this world, but I am not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins and you will die in your, me, that you will die in your sins and you If you will, do die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Okay, so that's, what is that, I am who I am? Yahweh, we say. Yahweh. Yeah. Okay. And that just turn, give them apoplectic <laughs> response. <laughs> well, not yet, because they, they're, they're still trying, they, they haven't yeah, figured out what he's talking just, about. They just couldn't handle that, and that's not, Jesus answered, what I have told you from the very beginning, I have much to say to you, much to condemn you for. The one who sent me, however, is truthful, and I tell you the world only what I have heard from him. Yeah, okay. Duane, you want to pick it up there? That, that must have been pretty biting to, to hear them say, I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for. Yeah. Wow. They were supposed to be the saints. Yes. The righteous people. Well, they can't learn the lesson any younger, could they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big blunt at times, I guess. Okay, Duane. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. It seems so clear to me, but mm -hmm. anyway. So he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Okay, when you do what? Oh. When you kill me, I'm going to prove to you who I am, okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Then you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Okay, I'll start. Many who heard Jesus say these things believed in him. Who's he talking to? Now, we, there might have been other witnesses there, but basically he's addressing the Sanhedrin. They asked Jesus, were, were we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon in you? I mean, that's about as bad as you can possibly say about somebody. I have no demon, Jesus answered. I honor my father, but you dishonor me. I am not seeking honor for myself, but there is one who is seeking it and who judges in my favor. I am telling you the truth. Whoever obeys my teaching will never die. Huh? They said to him, now we are certain that you are a demon. You have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets died. Yet you say that whoever obeys your teaching will never die. Our father Abraham died. You do not claim to be greater than Abraham, do you? <laughs> and the prophets also died. Who do you think you are? Jim? Jesus answered, if I were to honor myself, that honor would be worth nothing. 
The one who honors me is my father. The one you say, excuse me, the very one you say is your God. Well, so he's, he's being right. very clear now, isn't he? Right. You have never known him, but I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I, excuse me, but I do know him and I obey his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced that he was, excuse me, that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. Okay. Last week we talked about how Abraham could see his coming. Was it had to be a vision. Yep. Hey, go ahead. They said to him, you are not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was born, I am. Wow. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Goodness. Mm, 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 mm. You think his disciples were there when that happened? Mm. Jesus says that they, uh, I'm sorry, Dwayne, let me give that one to you. Bible study guide there. Jesus says that they knew neither him nor the Father, John 8, 19. They should have known both, but these men were self-deceived. They were so caught up in their own traditions and philosophies that even with Jesus right before them, doing all the things that he did and saying the things that he said, all powerful revelations of the Father, they still rejected him. Wow, from our Bible study guide. These religious leaders were no more advanced than the ones in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah 29, 13 tells us, the Lord said, these people claim to worship me, but their words are meaningless and their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions which they have simply memorized. And Ellen White comments, as a golden treasure, truth has been entrusted or entrusted to the Hebrew people. The Jewish economy bearing the signature of heaven had been instituted by Christ himself in types and symbols. The great truths of redemption were, were veiled. Yet when Christ came, the Jews did not recognize him to whom all these symbols pointed. They had the word of God in their hands, but the traditions which had been handled down from generation to generation and the human interpretation of those scriptures hid from them the truth as it is in Jesus. The spiritual import of the sacred writings was lost. The treasure house of all knowledge was open to them, but they knew it not. Jim? God does not conceal his truth from men. By their course of action, they make it obscure themselves. Christ gave the Jewish people abundant evidence that he was the Messiah but his teaching called for a decided change in their lives. They saw that they were received, excuse me, so they, they, they saw that if they received Christ, they must give up their cherished maxims and traditions, their selfish, ungodly practices. It requires a sacrifice to receive changeless, eternal truth. Therefore, they would not admit the most conclusive evidence that God could see, excuse me, God could give not admit the most conclusive evidence that God could give to establish faith in Christ. They professed to believe the Old Testament scriptures, yet they refused to accept the testimony contained therein concerning Christ's life and character. They were afraid of their being convinced lest they should be converted and be compelled to give up their preconceived opinions. Wow. The treasure of the gospel that the way, the truth, and the life among them, but they rejected the greatest gift of, that heaven had could be could be that heaven could bestow from Ellen White. Wow. Uh, Christ Object Lessons. Yeah. Wow. Well, what did Jesus mean in John eight twenty three by saying, "You belong to this world here below, but I come from above"? Or in the New King James Version, "You are from beneath, but I am from above." Jesus says to them. You are from beneath, John 8, 23. In other words, however religious they may be, these were not spiritual godly men. They had a form of godliness, see 2 Timothy 3, 5,
But that was all. They had outward piety, but inward disbelief. Okay, John spent most of John 8, which we've just gone through and looked at, referring to Jesus as the sublime and divine Son of God, sent by his heavenly Father to help hopeless earthlings. Everything Jesus talked about was heavenly. He was the heavenly light that illuminated a world darkened by sin. The Father brought witness to that. He sent his Son from on high to be a true witness of the truth. All the gifts that heaven bestowed on us in the person of Jesus were contrasted with earthly things when the Savior said to the Jewish leaders, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world, John 8, 23. Ellen White said some amazing things about the last hours Jesus spent with his disciples. And there, here's just a couple of them, Jim. From Ellen White, Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfectly human, excuse me, his perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 644, 664. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 671. So Jesus was, Ellen White suggests that Jesus was giving these kind of messages to his disciples because what's he doing? He's preparing them for what's coming. He's educating he's, them. He's, yeah, he's going to be gone. He says, and you need to be, you can be this kind of people if you choose to follow me and follow me. In our days of scientific discovery and amazing things going on around the world, it, is it hard to convince people that the statements from the Bible, which were written thousands of years ago, are relevant to our lives today? Do you believe in the authority of Scripture and the predictions in the Old Testament about the life of Jesus? Could you give a convincing argument about those issues to an unbeliever? Dwayne? As the incarnate Son of God, Jesus came to save this world, this sinful world. He was one with the Father. Thus Jesus said and did everything in accordance with the will of the Father. Christ was God's greatest gift to humanity, and without such a gift, the world would be doomed. Yet sadly and ironically, in spite of this truth, most of the world which he created did not believe in him. Neither did his own people. John made this point abundantly clear. What a tragedy that God's creatures made in his image rejected his indispensable gift. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And John, if you, John 12, 32 would have been really appropriate in there because all they're talking about, he came to save the world. He was also came to educate the universe. heavenly intelligence that were in existence yep. prior. Yep. Jesus often spent a great portion of the night, sometimes all night, talking with his father. Luke 6, 12. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. And that was just before he chose his disciples. It is important for us to recognize that many of these Old Testament prophecies had a fulfillment in their original context in the Old Testament, as well as a second fulfillment pointing forward to the life of Jesus. The behavior of Judas was predicted nearly 1,000 years earlier. Um, I don't know if we have time. Isn't that what to... they call type and anti-type? Yes. Um, well, let's just look at Psalm 41.9. Even my best friend, the one I trusted most, he was carrying the, the money bag. The one who shared my food has turned against me. I mean, you know, and it's other places that are similar. Fulfilled messianic prophecies, which very often deal with human relationships, dynamics, revealed much regarding Christ's character. Let's consider two such examples. The first prophecy is found in Isaiah 41, 9, which predicts, even my own fam familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me, from the New King James Version. 
Jesus applied that prophecy to himself as the one betrayed by a friend. I quote, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his seal against me. And you remember what happened when Jesus was choosing his disciples? Did he choose Judas? Judas elbowed his way in. He wanted to be a part. And Jesus said to him, what? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Trying to discourage him. <laughs> well, okay. Bible study guide, Jim. In the Mideast culture to this day, sharing food and some with someone is a special act of bonding that brings emotional and spiritual closure, closeness to a relationship. Thus, duplicity by one toward another with whom food has been shared is a sign of betrayal. Jesus, For sure. Jesus spent three days and a half. Three and a half years. He spent three and a half years. I don't want to dream about it. Not only eating with Judas, but forgiving and encouraging him. During this time, Jesus sought to protect the reputation of Judas. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. How did he try to protect the reputation of Judas? He didn't call him out in front of everybody. Yeah? Give an example. Well, when he was, he, with the, the food, he said, whoever I dip this in is going to mm -hmm. do something. But they, he didn't make a big production out of it. He yeah. just, and when he went out, the disciples thought what? He was going out to make He's an got, offering or something. Going out to give an offering to the poor. So clearly, Jesus had preserved Judas's reputation so well that the disciples, they didn't have any question about Judas. I mean, they must have had some idea that he wasn't a perfect saint, but at least, anyway. It didn't fit their paradigm. They couldn't imagine somebody yeah. would be that close and, and mm -hmm would betray her. I mean, if, if that's, that's a good story there. Where, where we, During this time, Jesus sought to protect the reputation of Judas. Though Jesus had ample justification for doing so, he did not seek to expose Judas to the, as a thief publicly. In return, Judas sold Jesus for 30 shekels, the price of a common slave. Then on the night of Saver's rest, Judas approached Jesus and kissed him despite the treacherous betrayal. Jesus actually called Judas friend. Jesus said to him, friends, why have you come? And why have you come? Imagine just. Here's the passage itself, Matthew 26, 50. Jesus answered, be quick about it, friend. Then they came, arrested Jesus and held him. Be quick about it, friend. Mm. Zechariah 13, 6 says what? Twain. Then if someone asks him, what are those wounds on your chest? He will answer, I got them at a friend's house. Wow. Well, let's think about Zechariah 13, 6. This verse talks about the wounds that Jesus received by means of his crucifixion. His side was pierced and his hands were well wounded. Zechariah foretold in this verse that Jesus would receive these wounds and the house of his friends. By implication, Jesus refers to his arch betrayer as his friend and to his crew of crucifiers, crucifiers among the Jewish leaders as his friends. I mean, imagine Jesus referring to those people that way. Thus, the pure and innocent shed blood of Christ does not cry out in vengeance against those who spilled it. His wounded hands are not clenched in wrath. They are stretched forth to embrace all in love and reconciliation. Wow. A number of the details of Jesus' crucifixion are mentioned in Psalm 22. Let's look at that for just a second. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Where did you hear that again? Jesus hanging on the cross. Yeah. And then if you drop down, there's a bunch of my, we shouldn't probably take time to do all this. Um, all, the, all, all who see me jeer at me, they stick out their tongues and shake their heads. 
you relied on the Lord, they say, why doesn't he save you? If the Lord likes you, why doesn't he help you? For example, there's others. Um, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like melted wax. My throat is dry as dust. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. But down here below, all my bones can be seen. My enemies look at me and stare. They gamble my, for my clothes and divide them among themselves. Yeah. But no, not all of that is the words of Jesus. <laughs> That's... No, but I mean, there the, are parallels. What did, do each of the following passages from John's Gospel reveal Jesus as the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy? Um, let's see, whose turn is it? John? No, I'm sorry, not, <laughs> I'm looking at John. Dwayne? I think, I think it's Jim. There's mine? Yeah. Okay, John, John 2, 2, verses 16 and 17. He ordered those who sold the pigeons, take them out of here. Stop making my fa father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that the scripture says, my devotion to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. Good news, Bible. And then the Old Testament. Psalm 69, verse 9. My devotion to your temple burns in me like a fire. The insults which are hurled at me, excuse me, at you, fall on me. Good news, Bible. I always amuse. Do you know what Jesus called the temple? that these people, this, this, this marketplace they were calling it, what did he call that? Do you remember a den of thieves? Mm -hmm. What is a den of thieves? Sounds like a prison. No, it's not a prison. It's a place where thieves gather the, all their loot in a place where, where they're hidden from the public eye and divide it all up. That's what a den of thieves is. Mm. So, <laughs> Jesus, secret hideout. Huh? Secret it's hideout. their secret hideout, yeah. Well, they're doing things under, underhandedly, aren't they? They're yeah. that part, of the, part of the hypocrisy. And then in John 8, 7, 38, whoever believes in me should drink. As the scripture says, streams of life-giving water will pour out from my side. And then Jeremiah 2, 13, the Lord said, for my people have committed two sins. They have turned away from me. They springs of fresh water and they have Jug cisterns, crack cisterns that can hold no water at all. So Jesus is saying, I am the fresh water. He said that to Jeremiah back in the Old Testament. And of course, he said it's a number of places in the New Testament. Continuing comparing John's gospel and the Old Testament predictions, the handling of the Passover lambs in the Old Testament times was to foreshadow the crucifixion of Christ. Duane, how, what, was, what was the parallel there? This was done to make the scripture come true. Not one of his bones will be broken. Okay, go ahead. The, compar the, the, the pa parallel passage. Numbers 9, 12. The Lord told Moses to tell the people, do not leave any of the food until the following morning and do not break any of the animal's bones. Observe the Passover according to all the regulations. So there it is, very specifically, and he, Jesus fulfills that. Finally, it seems that the evidence had become almost overwhelming, and this was the result. The price, precise fulfillment of the many Messianic prophecies in the life and ministry of Jesus is simply awe-inspiring. Awe These Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled with incredible accuracy. The most hardened skeptic and doubter doubter is rendered defenseless against the avalanche of evidence. And, you know, I don't know how much opportunities you people out there have to, to look at what's happened in the, archae in the world of archaeology, but they're finding more and more things every day that fit with what's in the Bible and support, I mean, even the destruction of Jerusalem back in the days of the back of J D Daniel and Jeremiah and, and, and Ezekiel and so forth. They're finding all the stuff from that time. And I mean, recently they've done some fantastic things in digging up Sodom and Gomorrah, proving that it happened exactly what the Bible said. It's, it's just amazing. These Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled with incredible accuracy. They most hardened skeptic and doubter is rendered defenseless against the avalanche of evidence. Um, and I mean, almost nobody doubts now that Jesus existed. I mean, a lot of people were skeptical about it in the past, but 
There's just too much evidence. Though Jesus knew how hardened the Jewish leaders were, he never gave up on them. He always tried from every possible angle to convince their stubborn hearts. Wow. Though many were not responsive to him, he continued to reach out to them so that at the very least, they might know that they were a de that there was a declare of truth among them. It is easy to be critical of the Jewish leaders and be baffled by their lack of faith in their own scriptures regarding the Messiah. And, I mean, you know, they knew that Messiah was coming. They had lots of evidence that Messiah was coming. But what was, the, what was the real problem with their interpretation of the Old Testament? Remember that in the Old Testament, nobody knew anything at all about, well, they, they applied all the prophecies that were in the Old Testament to the first coming. See, And so when it talks about Jesus and Zechariah and places like that, that he's going to come in power and glory and so forth, well, that's what they expected. Then you come to the New Testament. In the New Testament, nobody knew anything at all about a third coming. They didn't know anything about a millennium or a third coming until clear at the very end of Revelation. Nobody except John. None, Paul has never heard of a millennium. It's amazing. You stop and think about it. Well, it's easy to be critical to the Jewish leaders and to be baffled by their lack of faith in their own scriptures regarding the Messiah. But how would we have reacted if we were in the same position? If our utmost priority was to anticipate a Jewish, not a divine military conqueror in the tradition of Moses or David, one who could vanquish the Roman presence from Israel and break its yoke. Remember even Christ's disciples, those closest to him were slow to believe in his spiritual kingdom. Indeed, it was only after his resurrection that they truly believed. We have these words, John 2, 22. So when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture what Jesus had said. So turning to the resurrection, Jesus arose from the grave using his own power Earlier in John 2, 19 and 10, 17 to 18, 17 to 18, he had told them what he was going to do. Jim? From the writers of Ellen White, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee, the savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life <clears throat> that I may take it up again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. And what, 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 makes, what, what makes that unique about Christ? Could any creature do that? No. It's very important for, that we recognize, and the New Testament says this, and I, I understand that. The New Testament, some people in the New Testament say that the Father raised Jesus. Some places in the New Testament says he was raised by the Holy Spirit, but the actual fact is Jesus said, I lay down my life, I do it voluntarily. I mean, I know you're gonna kill me, but I, I, I could have prevented that if I wanted to. I give up my life and, and, went, and then I'm gonna raise it again. That's, I mean, that's an irrefutable proof of his divinity. And the whole system there was, was a demonstration of Jesus' character. Yeah. He, he didn't, sure. he didn't uh, yield to their taunts and things. He didn't condemn them. He did talk plainly to them. <laughs> pretty plainly, yeah. yeah they, You're of your father, the devil. That's pretty yeah. plain. <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. he has a message. Like you go to, go to this town. He says, well, if they don't want to listen, dust your shoes off and go to the next town. But he had to leave them with some kind of a message yeah. so that over, maybe they don't respond now, but later, when certain circumstances uh, fit. Anyway, where'd we lead? They don't. Okay. Destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. That's the end of that. Okay. Well, you can go John back. 10, to, yeah. 17, and 18, Eight. and 2, verse 19. And then Eloise's comment. Zarevages, Zarevages, 785. That was his final compelling argument, and it was irrefutable. I mean, what can you say? Someone rises up themselves, and you know, God and all his angels were there. The devil and all his angels were, they were absolutely determined to keep that grave shut. 
100 Roman soldiers, well, they were there too, but they didn't amount to much compared to all the others. And Gabriel comes down, and the two, Jesus had two guardian angels all through his life. They came down, one of them rolled the stone back, and the other one said, your father calls you, and Jesus rose out of that tomb in his own power from the dead. That was his final, final compelling argument. It was ir irrefutable. Jesus told us that there were many other things that could have been written about, John told us about Jesus. Although Jesus was continually pointing the disciples to the scriptures which foretold his ministry, when did the disciples finally understand that the scriptures pointed to his death and resurrection? It's only after he died and was resurrected and appeared to them that they finally got it. Quote, therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said to them, this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Have you ever been discouraged because it seemed like your witnessing efforts were mostly fruitless? Imagine how Jesus felt. I mean, he's, the, he's God himself. He has all kinds of power. He could have done all kinds of things. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing diseases. This is an excellent study because we've come to so many times where Jesus is talking to the disciples, excuse me, talking to the Jewish people there, yeah. but they didn't understand it. And when he's finally hanging on the cross, he says, Eloi, Eloi, or Eli, Eli, depends on the text. Yeah. Those are a variation on the t word Elohim. Mm -hmm. He's talking to this, he, they're his kids. Elohim is God's creatures. Yeah, he, well, Elohim is, is God himself. He's talking to God too. Well, he's talking to this father. Yeah. He, he didn't, he's not talking to, he's talking to his kids. That's, he, he's not complaining to his father. He's part of the whole lesson. No, but he's saying that, lesson. that he, he died because his father uh, who was the only source of life, left him. Mm. Have you ever been discouraged because it seemed like your witnesses were mostly fruitless anyway? Um, John 8, 30, many who heard Jesus say these things believed in him. Eventually, a number of Jewish leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees, believed in him. Acts 6, verse 7 and Acts 15, verse 5 tell us that even Sadducees and Pharisees finally became, a number of them finally became faithful followers and members of the, of the church. People's initial responses might be, you know, funny, but they will finally believe many of them did. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these lessons and the compelling reasons that you provide, supporting all the things that we know we should believe. Help us to be clear and to make our, our evidence clear to others is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.